Okay, well, I am delighted today to have as our guest one of Boston's best architects and my, one of my closest friends, David Hassin. Uh, David is the president of Hassin & Associates, an architecture and interior design firm recognized internationally for its work in housing, retail, and interior design, as well as being a principal at Sasaki Associates, Incorporated. Mr. Hassin is active in civic, academic, and professional organizations and has chaired and served on numerous boards and juries in Boston and across the country. He currently serves on the Northeastern University School of Architecture Advisory Board, for which I am enormously grateful, by the way, uh, and regularly serves as a guest critic at design schools across the country. He is a fellow in the American Institute of Architects. Uh, David has also recently been inducted into the New England Design Hall of Fame. Originally from Switzerland, he graduated summa cum laude from Princeton and received his master's in architecture with distinction from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Please join me in welcoming David Hassin. George, thank you very much for that very nice introduction, which makes me feel like I'm 100 years old. Um, but uh, it's really wonderful to be here um, as part of uh, George's wonderful course about understanding design. Um, what I thought I would do today is spend just a few minutes talking about uh, some of our work, particularly some of the things that we've been doing over the last few years, and try and contextualize it a little bit in, in the sense of uh, the journey that uh, an architecture and design firm uh, can take, which is often a little bit different than what you might have planned. Um, and what I mean by that, which is potentially something that, that um, has uh, relevance to all of you here uh, in terms of the journeys that you will all take in your career. Um, you know, we're often asked, what do we do? What do we specialize in? And um, it's a difficult question to answer because we really do a lot of different kinds of projects for a relatively small office of about 20 people. Um, up on the, on the board here are some projects, uh, loft housing projects, uh, Project Place is uh, SRO housing for uh, people transitioning out of homelessness into the workplace. Uh, directly below, below it is 27 Wareham Street, which was a luxury apartment project. Uh, we also do a lot of work in the community um, and even uh, boutique hotels like the Chandler Studios. Uh, some other projects, uh, one of which I'll talk about today, FP3, restaurants like Myers and Chang, some of you may know that, stores like Fresh on Newbury Street, some of you folks may have shopped there as well, and then very, very high-end residential interiors and office interiors like those uh, for PJA and Zero Marlboro. When I started practicing 20 years ago, uh, one of the things that I was not very prescriptive about was actually the kind of work that I wanted to do. I was willing to uh, kind of go on it, so I started in my community, and I was willing to sort of take the journey and to see where the work would take me, where one project would lead to another person, where one client would lead to another person. And um, the, uh, that actually ended up being uh, formalized almost as our mantra in the office as a no boundaries. That, that was when we struggled to think about what our philosophy as a design firm was. We kept coming to back to the idea that we really actually didn't want to establish boundaries around the kind of work that we did because we really were interested in exploring design from so many different perspectives and so many different angles. Um, I thought that today I would uh, give you a little bit of a snapshot, I'm calling it design in the innovation district, a little bit of a snapshot of some of the work that we've been doing over the last few years and show you how one project led to another, the challenges that we faced with some of those projects and how those challenges ultimately ended up becoming uh, not only opportunities for the design, but opportunities for all the folks uh, who work with me, uh, which is a very collaborative, it's not a solitary practice, it's a very collaborative practice, um, and how that actually stimulated problem solving uh, in ways that were maybe different than a lot of conventional projects that you see. So uh, the first project is FP3. And um, uh, many of you probably uh, know the Fort Point Channel area. 
Um, some of you are very new to Boston, um, but the Fort Point Channel area, that little cluster of buildings that you see there, uh, constituted the woolen and warehouse district uh, in uh, the late 19th century, early 18, uh, 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 late 19th, 19th century, early 20th century, um, where uh, all of those parking lots that you see, which used to be rail yards and shipping uh, depots, uh, would bring goods from all over the world and they would come to this place. And uh, those buildings were built to showcase uh, the wares that were coming from all over the world to buyers that came to Boston from all over the country um, to distribute uh, their, uh, uh, their wares. And we were given a unique opportunity to uh, take a look at two buildings that occupied the very center of the district um, and reimagine them from the kind of warehouse, sort of B-class office building that they had become into a new kind of heart uh, for a district that was uh, potentially going to change into a much more interesting mixed use uh, part of a more vibrant city that was spreading uh, uh, across the Fort Point Channel into this area. Um, uh, these are uh, some plans and sections of what we ultimately built, which was a, a loft and apartment, luxury apartment building that was uh, uh, on the ground level, uh, had uh, a number of retailers, restaurants, artist housing, a gallery, and a number of things that I'll tell you about. But one of the reasons I wanted to show you this first was that one of the challenges that we had was that because this was a historic district, the economics of the building were such that in order to restore the building properly, we needed to add height, needed to add square footage to the building. But we didn't want to do it in a way that was going to really transform or violate the character of the neighborhood that people liked so much. So we had to explore ways that we would add floors to the top of the building. And this became not only an important design challenge, but actually a very, very complicated technical challenge. So this is a shot where you see the building under construction, and we had to hollow out the building to uh, put a new structure and new elevators and new code compliance systems through the entire building to literally support the upper floors of the building on top of these historic buildings. So when you go there and you look at the building and you think that all of those floors are actually resting on top of these old, uh, older buildings, that's actually not at all the case. What it actually is is a new building sitting on very, very long stilts that are running through the building and supporting a new building on top of an old building. And so I think a lot of times people don't understand when you're, look at, when you're working on uh, uh, projects like this how complex they are and how those kinds of problems uh, really influence the design solutions that you ultimately come up with. So we, in, in realizing that we had to sort of put this new building up on stilts on top of an old building, and the little diagram that you see on the right was something that the Boston Globe published to sort of explain uh, how new work was threaded through old buildings. Um, that suggested some uh, very interesting design solutions to us. And it was very clear to me and to our design team that what was on top of the building should not look like the rest of the building, but should actually um, be something that was uh, fastened to, connected to, supportive of the architecture of the old building, but that it was its own uh, thing as well. And so here you see a shot of the building where the uh, two uh, existing warehouses uh, are on the uh, right-hand side of the screen. There is an infill uh, building which we designed to be sympathetic to the rhythm of the neighborhood, and then our new three-story addition, which provided these spectacular penthouses with amazing views and outdoor space that would attract people to this neighborhood who might not otherwise think of this as a residential neighborhood. Um, this is a shot, again, showing the infill building and showing the two very different strategies that we had. One which was about 
uh, the context that we were working in and uh, building a building that fit in to the historic fabric that had the same depth and detail as the historic buildings that were adjacent to it and the uh, Boston Fire Station, Fire Museum that was uh, immediately to the left. And that juxtaposition of that history with something that was made from materials that were consistent with the neighborhood, but that had a very, very different formal language. Um, and then this is a sort of more of a close-up shot showing those penthouse spaces. And we used materials like pre-patinated copper and metal in different colors and a lot of materials that you would typically find on the rooftops of the, of the neighborhood, but we tried to uh, use them in uh, new and interesting ways. So um, this, pro this shot is now taken at a lower street level and begins to explain our, uh, our planning ideas, which was that it was so important that the Congress Street corridor, the visual corridor down Congress Street, retained its character and its integrity, and that we didn't want this suddenly to be a much taller building from the streetscape than uh, the buildings that surrounded it. So you can see that we set our addition back. We didn't hide it, but we revealed it in very, very specific places. So here you see it above the fire station. Um, this is a view of one of the outdoor terraces looking back at the city. Um, and uh, I'll come back to another shot, but this is a shot of the lobby uh, in the building. And one of the important principles that we had with doing an adaptive reuse project was we wanted to reuse as much of the old building as we possibly could. So you saw, remember that hole that you saw sort of cut through the building? Well, we took a lot of massive 100-year-old timbers out of the building to make that possible. And we didn't want to just toss them. So we sent all that uh, lumber up to a mill in Maine, and we had it remilled and used as a, a, a material in the lobby that reflected the fact that the old parts of the building were not just being reused, but were actually being, as we say, adaptively reused in a new context. And in this case, it was a gallery for the Fort Point artist community that also functions as a lobby for the building. So here you see a little bit of a, a detail of that. Um, now, before I leave FP3 and go on to the Seaport Square Master Plan, one of the things that was really interesting about this project is it did become a new anchor for the district. It did introduce mixed-use, residential, uh, gallery space, artist loft space into a part of town which had traditionally not had that. And at the same time that that building was being built and designed, what, there were, were plans, which you're now seeing realized uh, down in South Boston, for um, the creation of a, of a uh, new district, now known as the Innovation District, but the Seaport District, um, that was happening all around it. So the FP3 project was actually an introduction for our firm to that part of town. And we learned a lot about the communities that were in that part of town, about what their concerns were, about what their interests were in how a new neighborhood would form around uh, the existing Fort Point uh, district. And so when the Seaport Square master plan was being developed, and you can see the huge swath of land uh, with the uh, black um, uh, dashed lines around it that form the area of the Seaport Square master plan, we were, based on the work that we did at FP3, asked by the out-of-town uh, architect, Cone Pedersen Fox, to help advise them um, to make sure that the master plan reflected the values and the interests of the community that we had just spent several years working with on the FP3 project. The Seaport Square uh, area is, uh, was owned by someone named Frank McCourt, who some of you may know who owns the, uh, owned the LA Dodgers for many years. And he was a parking lot magnet. Um, and uh, he uh, sold all of these lots and moved out to LA to buy the Dodgers. Um, and uh, Morgan Stanley, um, the, uh, the banking giant, and a local development team, Boston Global Investors, picked up the land and decided to uh, create a master plan for uh, that district. 
Now, as the master plan was evolving, and you can sort of see a glimpse of the scale of the development in the uh, left hand in this, the uh, image on the left hand side, Mayor Menino um, decided that this district should not become just like any other uh, uh, business district that was expanding in the city. Um, and with the advice of his chief of staff and other people at the Boston Redevelopment Authority, he dubbed it the Innovation District. And um, our developer and client team really didn't know exactly what that meant. Um, and the master planning was well underway when that was happening. And so we were asked to come in and help the team reimagine the master plan in the context of what an innovation district might look like and who it would be designed for. And uh, we created this Seaport Square vision book, which you can see online at the Boston Redevelopment Authority, and talked a lot about the mixed use uh, character that should happen in this district, the kinds of businesses that it should try to attract, the kind of residents that Boston is trying to retain, um, uh, uh, largely graduates from schools like, uh, like Northeastern, and how to make it more than, uh, than it might otherwise have been. As part of this um, booklet, uh, the idea of an innovation center uh, was uh, born, and it really came from the city, uh, it came from the city of Boston, that there be some sort of a building that was an urban lab, um, as it says here, for the city's core principles of innovation. And I have to tell you that um, the attributes that uh, we assigned to this urban lab uh, we developed uh, as, the, as, uh, as an advisor, as an architecture and design office, thinking about what, how to program a building of a type that really was a new kind of building type. I mean, you hear about innovation centers at universities and hospitals and so forth, but this was intended to be a public building and a very public symbol of what this neighborhood was going to be like. So how should it operate and what should it be? And that brings me to the story of District Hall, which is that um, amazingly, through the process of trying to help the city and the developer um, uh, uh, come up with a concept for what the building was to be, we were then actually hired to uh, build and uh, to design and build the building, which, um, as some of you may know, I know I was speaking to someone in the office recently, uh, just opened a few weeks ago. And this is really a fascinating project and a really fascinating building for us um, and, and something that uh, brings a lot of threads of the practice that we've had over the last 20 years together in one building. So as I said, you know, early on, our practice didn't really have a lot of boundaries. We were working on, um, on ad agencies. We worked with IDEO on, uh, on, some, on their offices. We, uh, we worked on doing prototype retail. We were doing all kinds of different sorts of housing in the city and uh, always experimenting. And the District Hall project became a, um, a way to bring a lot of the things that we had been thinking about over the years together in, in building a building that was going to serve multiple functions. So district, and I thought that it would really be interesting for you guys to hear a little bit about how the building was conceived and designed so that when you go down there, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, in the weeks and months to come, um, that you have a little bit of insight into, into our thinking as architects and designers, and you'll understand better why the building is the way it is. So here you can see um, the, the district hall site that we were given, uh, its relative relationship to the FP3 project and to the Seaport Square master plan. And uh, this is a, you know, uh, old Google Earth image um, showing uh, what this area looked like in the not too distant past, 2011. Uh, if you go down there, it's already quite different. You can see the only real building that was down there was uh, one Marina Park Drive, which is where Mass Challenge was uh, located for, uh, I don't know if they're still there or movie, it's still there, uh, where Mass Challenge is located. Um, and this one park, and of course the Institute for Contemporary Art sort of sitting uh, kind of by itself waiting uh, for the party uh, all around it to start happening. Um, the site that we were given was kind of in this no man's land of parking lots. Um, but it was actually pretty important because 
it was a connection between the Four Point Channel neighborhood that you see on the lower left and the waterfront and a way across uh, what was otherwise sort of a series of barricaded parking lots. So as a result of that, one of the pieces of the program was this notion of a connector, an ICA connector that would allow people who are arriving on the Silver Line or the MBTA to uh, be able to traverse this sort of no man's land and get to the waterfront and get to um, the ICA. Um, this then reflected the larger build out that will be happening over the next few years, the sort of pattern of blocks and buildings that uh, is rising all around the site right now. And there were a number of principles that as we were evaluating the context of the future of the site that we were thinking about. One was something like a view corridor as you're looking down the street, this main street um, that connects through to the park and the water. We did not want to block that view. Another were the different site axes that existed on the site. So for example, there was the orthogonal arrangement of the blocks, and then there was this new pier that was being built out into Fan Pier Cove, which was going to be um, uh, where the um, uh, boat, uh, the commuter boat was going to arrive, which we thought was important. And then the park that had been built directly across the street, which was another very strong figural build, uh, form, uh, landscape form right there. So we were looking at all of those. We were also looking at the fact that eventually there would be entrances to all kinds of buildings and retailers all around, and how did we want to relate to that? The traffic uh, patterns, how would people arrive here, and, and where, how would they, uh, by, whether by T or by Hubway or by whatever. Um, so as I mentioned, this was the site that was given to us. The program was given to us in, in basically two parts, one which was relatively low um, uh, and one which was higher. So the higher volume contained restaurant spaces and meeting spaces like this uh, room, not quite as grand as this room, but a meeting room like this, and the low-rise spaces which were much more utilitarian in nature. So, you know, a lot of architects might have been given this envelope and kind of stopped there and sort of decided that this is, you know, let's figure out how we're going to decorate this, this uh, shed. Um, but we wanted to take the influences that we had observed from the site and manipulate the building into something different. So the first, of course, was this uh, view corridor. And we decided, and the second was this pier. So we twisted the building uh, to orient to this pier and to sort of peek into the view corridor without blocking the view corridor. The second move was to actually push the building away from Seaport Boulevard because we knew that there was going to be a future MBTA station and Hubway stop there, and so we, that, uh, decide, that forced us to kind of push the building up on the site a little bit. The next thing was we wanted to lift the building to create a theater space that had good acoustics and a good spatial character. So you can see that suddenly the form is beginning to evolve into something else. And then finally, the big gesture to the water, a bit, the building really orienting uh, towards the water and towards the, um, the, uh, the future pier. And lastly, um, making sure that the building, because it sits on this site that can be uh, uh, accessed from all points, that it would have multiple entrances and multiple ways to engage with it. So you begin to see how this very simple form starts to turn into something else. Then uh, we, put, we took what we had uh, our ideas and we dropped them into a uh, sort of a three-dimensional model of the city and began to look at it in context. And ultimately, this was the uh, rendering of the building that we were proposing. The building is theoretically a 10-year building. It's theoretically a temporary building intended to act as a uh, community anchor and a networking, um, uh, networking center for the emerging innovation and technology uh, community in the, in the uh, district. And we wanted the building to, to be symbolically strong and symbolically civic. Um, this is a view looking from the other side of the building, and I'll tell you a little bit about the forms that we used and why we use them. But if you look at this long form, you see some signage on the uh, front and back of the building. And in an interesting public 
public-private partnership, we're actually working with a digital sign company to blend digital art and digital advertising uh, to help pay for the operations of the building. So we, as architects, were very involved in bringing a lot of partners together uh, to help make the building happen. Um, and I'll get into that in, in a moment. Anyway, this is finally the site plan. As you can see, the building will sit adjacent to a large pu public park, which will be the center of the neighborhood, the center of the district. And uh, we've tried to uh, make the building uh, relate to the park uh, in lots of important ways. Now, you know, here's where the sort of uh, some of the architectural language and, and design metaphors come in. I remember when I told you at the beginning of this talk that this site used to be where the uh, ships from all over the world met the, the uh, trains that took ideas and products all across the country. We were very excited about that as a, as a metaphor for a new kind of uh, uh, port, if you will, where ideas would be exchanged um, with people, with one another, and with the rest of the country and the world in a different sort of way. But actually rooting the imagery of the building back into that idea that Boston has traditionally been this hub, this harbor, where ideas and people uh, were exchanged. And um, so the uh, building is organized into essentially two elements, one long bar, which uh, we call the bar, as you see, which is sort of reminiscent of the boxcars and trains that used to come to this site. And then the shell, which is where the restaurant and the uh, meeting uh, hall is, which is much more evocative of you know, uh, nautical imagery, nautical buildings, uh, the kind of sheds that uh, exist all up and down the New England coast for, for fishermen. Um, and we wanted to bring the language of those two buildings together to say that this building was not one thing or another, but it was about both, and it was about sharing those two ideas. So you can see in the plan that there are these two very different elements, uh, the more public elements like the meeting hall and the restaurant, and then these more private activities that occur uh, on the side of this kind of public path through the building. Um, and I'll, uh, this is a rendering that we did uh, to show how that might be illustrated. So some elements that you see here um, are the fact that the building is completely writable on the inside. Um, it's Idea Paint was one of our uh, design partners. And um, so anybody can come into this building and you know pretty much write it's like a graffiti, uh, a, a forum for graffiti, if you will, but hopefully intelligent graffiti. Um, and uh, the idea of this main spine that connects through the building that connected Seaport Boulevard to Northern Avenue. So the, ICA connector, which was originally an exterior path, which it still is, also became an internal connector where we were really trying to create a public way through a public building that would allow the public to engage with the activities that would be constantly changing and constantly taking place in this building. Um, this is sort of looking at it from the other side. And to the right is the meeting hall. And to the left is uh, the series of pods, we call them, which are places that can be uh, meeting spaces or can be uh, pop-up retail uh, or can be experimental in a number of uh, flexible futures. And that's really the idea of the building is flexibility. The idea that the building can be used in a bunch of different ways for a lot of different public forums. So um, this is the meeting hall. So for example, Tech Jam is happening, happened down there. Uh, Mobile Mondays, which is a big social gathering event uh, for a lot of entrepreneurs, is happening down there. Design Exchange, which is a program bringing a lot of design industry people together, um, is happening down there. And in fact, if you look on the glo at the globe today, you'll see that there's uh, sort of lunchtime dance parties that are happening in the space as an alternative to, as the newspaper puts it, the sort of typical lunch uh, meeting where you can kind of go to this place and hang out and, sh and um, be with your colleagues and your friends in a completely different way. In short, the building is about building community. I think of it as a kind of a public library for the 21st century. Now, we all know that Boston is not exactly a 24-hour city. Um, and one of the things that's exciting about this building was that the city recognized that this is a problem. 
And the restaurant that we put into it uh, by the, at the city's request is open breakfast, lunch, and dinner uh, from 6 in the morning till 2 in the morning. And the building is basically open when the restaurant is open and when the cafe is open. So this is also kind of a tremendous leap forward for the city in the sense that this is as close to a 24-hour building as Boston has. Now, I'm showing you these because these are some of the renderings that we used to sort of develop the concept, but here are the actual photographs of the building completed, or almost completed. Um, so you remember the rendering that I showed you earlier. Um, you know, it used to be in the old days, you were always a little bit surprised by how your building turned out. Um, not so much anymore. Um, you know, the, rendering, the renderings that we do in the office are so great. Um, that I, I have a pretty good sense of how the building is going to turn out. Although I must say that um, the way the building glows and uh, is set off was a pleasant surprise uh, for me. Um, this is a view uh, of the front of the building uh, showing clearly that very shell design on the left and the boxcar on the right and the restaurant which has, uh, well I'll get to that in a minute. This is the sort of building uh, kind of creeping along its site with a lot of folded planes. And a view from the stairs at the Institute of Contemporary Art. Looking back at the building, I know that Jill Medvedow at the ICA is very happy to have another smaller scaled neighbor uh, in the area that feels like a part of a cultural district um, uh, as opposed to a lot of the larger, more commercial buildings that are being built there. And if you go down there, there's a cafe hub that's uh, open. And uh, this is that, uh, that corridor. Philips Color Kinetics was a partner with us. So there's this uh, really fascinating uh, lighting, programmable lighting display that you can see during the day and at the night that links the front of the building to the back. And a shot of the restaurant. Um, you know, the idea that the building will be a place where ideas will be generated and businesses will be born and conferences will take place uh, is reflected a little bit in the notion of the light bulbs. It's uh, kind of the history of the light bulb um, hanging uh, from the uh, ceiling cloud. And uh, we like that because, you know, we have everything from LEDs to old uh, fashioned Edison bulbs. Um, and the idea was that, uh, you know, invention is uh, something that is uh, part of Boston's history and part of Boston's future. A shot looking back, remember when I was talking about how we oriented the building uh, towards that pier and the water? Uh, this shows you how the restaurant was rotated to take advantage of that view. And that is uh, just a quick short summary of District Hall. So when you go down there, you'll know a little bit more about how it all came together. Thank you. Um, well, thank you. I think actually, you know, a, a prelude to this conversation might be that um, how much you have foregrounded work on the sort of civic side in your career thus far. Um, what we didn't talk about is the instrumental role that you played in the development of the South End over the last 25 years, which these folks will take uh, as something that must have been in place forever, but was not. If you look at aerial pictures of the um, South Boston South End in the mid 80s, you will see a desolate, godforsaken place that has been replaced with an unbelievably vibrant community. And, and, and David's work both as an architect and as an urban designer has played a big part in that. And I want to get back to this, these sort of civic issues, I suppose. But let me throw you a little bit of a curve to start. Sure. Which is, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, you do all kinds of work, but you do a lot of residential work of different kinds, as you alluded to. And I just wonder, I don't think students probably appreciate how different um, the problem to be solved is in an apartment interior or a condo interior on the one hand, a freestanding house on the other hand, or a multi-unit urban building. And I wonder if you could just talk about that just a little bit. Because you know, those are really, on the one hand, they're residential enterprises. How different could they be? They've got bedrooms, they've got kitchens, they've got living rooms. But the fact is the, the sort of formative challenges are probably quite different. You know, they are. I mean, a lot of the issues, as you say, are, of course, very much the same. But, you know, I think it comes back to the client, mm. actually. Um, uh, you may have a client who's doing a private residential project that would have issues 
that might be very similar to an issues that, issues that you were dealing with in a multifamily residential project, but usually not, actually. Um, so, you know, as a designer, um, you know, I know a lot of people think that, come, that the designers come and they sort of, um, you know, generate ideas that other people react to, but I, I really believe that it starts with listening. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. So we had a project that was, you know, a kind of a classic development project. The, the developer's motivation is to make money mm -hmm. and to uh, build product that, that is, uh, is going to sell or rent or whatever it is. Um, so he's really meeting the market and it's about understanding that market. Mm. When we were doing the project for Project Place, which was about um, uh, developing uh, SRO units for people who had no homes at all, mm -hmm. and, we were, uh, and this was going to be the first home that they had in many years, and it was really about uh, offering a home to sort of change your life. Um, the issues were very different. Mm -hmm. And the way that we approached the problem was very different. And the client, of course, was very, very different. Right. Actually, the interesting thing is that the relationship between the SRO and the private residential project is almost more similar. Because when we're working with a private client, often private clients come to us because they also want to change their life. Mm -hmm. They're coming because they have a vision of how they want to right. live. Um, that is different than the way they're living I now. Out in the sub I, I raised my family in the suburbs. I'm moving, I'm moving into, the, into city. the city. I want my life. You know, actually, that's an, a, such an I really love empty nest. Uh, uh, it's like all your parents right. are really actually good clients because when they come to move back into the city, they're about, the, so many of them are about reinventing their lives, about right. starting over. And um, they actually don't want to bring their stuff. Right, right. right. Um, they're they not have really that taste. interested in the second or third bedroom for their kids <laughs> to come home. Not really. Um, um, and they're really interested in 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 um, starting fresh. And and that's really an exciting challenge, actually. Um, and actually, the best calls I get, you know, people. Private residential work is very difficult work. Um, you're working closely with people who have very particular needs and there are a lot of issues associated with it. And a lot of times people ask me, because we do a lot of commercial projects, why, why do you do private residential work? It's such a hassle. But, you know, when I get a call, I don't get calls from my commercial clients three months later saying, oh my God, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. You know, this was so great. You changed my life, you know. <laughs> I don't get those calls right, from, right. from you know, right. uh, for office from space. Boston Global Investors. You know, I mean, I love them, but I don't. I don't get that call. Um, but I do get those calls from our private residential clients, and um, and it's very gratifying. Right, right. Well, I have to say, I, I, you know, I, as you know, I don't practice regularly at all anymore. But I do recall so clearly, so vividly, uh, how hilarious the interactions on residential work can be from the easy stuff like we're looking for a room that is tall yet short, narrow yet wide. These are the, these are the tough deliverables. Um, but Especially when they're coming from two. The worst <laughs> is when you meet with someone and you think that everyone has agreed to what's <laughs> happening. And then the, 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 the meeting ends and I get a call a day later from either the husband or the wife saying, don't listen to what they said at all. <laughs> Right, you right. Know, what we really want to do is this. Right. We don't listen to we don't you know, listen to him or her at home. And, and it's like you know. And so you're like, uh, no, we we can't do this this way. Right. You know, this is not going to work. Right. Right. So. Right. Right. No, that's uh, analogous. The uh, husband and wife finally are in a position, maybe moving into the city to build their, or moving into another place to build their dream home. Right. And it is only after 25 years of marriage that they learn that their dreams have nothing to do with <laughs> exactly. each other. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. But be that as it may, we'll, we won't get into marriage counseling here. Yeah. Although that's part of the job. <laughs> um, well, you know, my question before was in some ways about how really the specific physical constraints are so different between, let's say, a site, and I know that you've done some work, you know, even in quite rural mm -hmm. sites, a freestanding house in a, in, a, in a very natural setting, versus the extremely explicit constraints of I've bought a um, raw 3,000 foot loft and I want you to do something with it. In other words, the contexts for these can be very different. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Now here's another here's another uh, thing that I thought would be great for you, and we can get to the more civic public issues because I really think you know this district hall, the genesis of district hall. Uh, well, and the fact that it's a, such an ongoing story and such a kind of, uh, you know, you, that you've had the opportunity to actually invent a catalyst for a whole new district of a city, I don't really know of a precedent for that. No, I know. Uh, it's kind of amazing, actually. Yeah. I mean, in Berlin, a little bit, that when they were redoing Potsdamer plots, they had a little viewing room right. that you could go in right. so that you could imagine, you could look out through holes in a certain direction and see a, a vision of what the city might be. This is sort of before right. digital stuff. But, but other than that, I can't think of too many. Um, but let me ask you this. I'm gonna to return to residential architecture a little bit because I think it's so interesting precisely because it is so personal and it is not about, you know, um, uh, commercial real estate is really a commodity. It, it comes in three classes at least, A, B, and C, mm -hmm. and, and it's sold by the square foot. It's like selling something by the pound or by the gallon. Mm -hmm. It is, a, it is the, in many ways, the definition of a commodity. Now, that's not to say that you can't you know, improve it, but, but, but that's how it's sort of conceived. Residential architecture is less that way. Mm -hmm. um, so let me ask you this. The, you know, there've been, there's been a dramatic change in domestic lifestyles um, over the la just in the last generation, but certainly over the last century. And for as an example, and I, I guess what I'm going to be trying to ask is, what are the physical ramifications of some of these? Let me give an example. If you think about how kitchens from the early 20th century to the present mm -hmm. in the average ha home have morphed, it, it, it's not at all just about appliances. It's about who's in the kitchen mm -hmm. and about what that person's relationship to the rest of the household is. Mm -hmm. So that the walls between the kitchen, which perhaps in wealthy homes once was stocked with servants and had pantries and things and, 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 and it was, its life was completely back of house, those walls have come down to the point where in many cases the kitchen is part of the most used, mm -hmm. it's simply a, an island in the most ro used room in the, in the house. I wonder, are there other examples of kind of the way people use their residential space that have changed that have had physical consequences like that? Well, you know, a lot, has, a lot has been written about this, but the kitchen one is, is an interesting one, in part because, so the kitchen originally was a service space that was separated from the rest of the home. Um, in fact, one of the big conversion projects in Boston, something that keeps a lot of architects and designers in Boston busy, is the conversion of homes that were built uh, in the earlier part of the century and in the last century, converting them specifically to take the kitchen out of that relationship to the rest of the house and open it up to a room that never really existed, the so-called family room or great room. Right. Um, what's interesting about that is that, uh, especially as you move up the sort of food chain of affluence, um, people want the kitchen, the kitchen is the heart of the home, but they also want it adjacent to a space where they can watch their kids doing homework or their, their family members watching the big game or whatever. What's happened is the living room has been, uh, and dining room, have been relegated to these sort of almost showpiece kind of status uh, spaces that don't really have a real function. Right. And um, uh, it's almost like an appendage that you don't kind of need anymore, like an animal sort of evolving into something else. Um, but they are still um, uh, a sign of uh, certain, they still mean something to people, and so people still want them. Still I just important. don't know how long that's going to last. Right. And, and, you know, at what point um, does the living room and the dining room just kind of completely go away? It is starting to happen mm. in, in, in places. Um, this is, I'm talking mostly about homes. Mm -hmm. But uh, in apartments, it's the same thing. I mean, an apartment space is at a premium, and um, the kitchen, even the way the kitchen is designed, it's no longer like kitchen cabinetry. You want your kitchen, kitchen it's now kitchen furniture, mm -hmm. because the kitchen is furniture in your main space, just like your couch or mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. media center. Right. Um, and, and, um, and so there is this sort of evolution of that you know that continues to happen. I mean, other spaces like that. I mean, you know, the 
the home office, mm -hmm. um, the, uh, you know, that, that flex room uh, becomes really, really important to a lot of people. Okay. You know, uh, like I was talking about empty nesters who, you know, uh, uh, may want a space for someone who might be coming home from college for, you know, a couple of weeks, but the rest of the time they're using it as an exercise space or they're using it as a home office. You know, how do you design a space like right. that? That gets into the issue of interiors as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the things that was always so interesting to me about blending architecture and interiors was that the two of them really worked hand in hand in my mind. It's not just about the room that you design, but it's how you furnish it right. Right. and what you put in it and how you design to allow for these flexible futures, which right. is how, you know, homes are being designed now. You know, it's, I, I actually, I'm increasingly fascinated by the, these sort of, um, you know, as you step back and you see these changes accrue and you realize which ones actually end up being truly meaningful. For me, one of the most significant changes in interior design is the flat screen television. Mm -hmm. As it has gotten thinner and thinner and as migrates towards becoming a surface, yes. um, wow, that just changes everything. It used yeah. to be an object, a big object. Yeah. We, we talked about it in in this like class, it was a it thing. Was like it was a like a tube and, yeah. centerpiece of the room. Yeah, it was exactly. a, and, and, and therefore it was a thing that you looked at instead of something that's in a way now increasingly part of the environment, yeah. which is a completely different conceptual enterprise and has massive consequences, especially for space tight urban dwelling. So I think, I think I love your point about the difference between like, you know, let's say the pragmatic and rhetorical needs of some rooms. How many times have we been to a home where you walk through and the, and the dining room was last used, you know, in the early part of the uh, George W. Bush administration? You know, right. I mean, actually, my parents' dining room, I believe, that was the last time it was here. Oh, I bet it was longer ago than that. Uh, you know, we just finished a project on Beacon Hill, a six story townhouse project where there was clearly room, I mean, all of these rooms had their floors and it was a big house. Right, right, right. And the owners um, were, I think, smart enough to understand that, that, you know, dedicating the front of the house with the beautiful view to this room that would get used once or twice a year right. was really foolish. Right, right, right. And um, so we designed this kitchen with this table that tucks into an island that you can bring it out and open it up and roll it into the other part of the room um, for as Thanksgiving needed. as needed. But then that space, most of the time, becomes a really great active family space. And um, you know, when you do stuff like that, you're never sure it's really going to work. And um, they love it. Yeah, yeah. You know, they love it. And, and I think that you know, that's, the, that's the kind of, that comes from listening, you know, from what their needs were, how they lived. Um, but, um, you know, that's the, the work that designers do. I mean, it, a, another great example is, and you probably, you know more about the, all these South End renovations than I do, but I've seen enough that make an island kitchen in the big bow front room that it's like, it seems like absolute, you know, um, in terms of historical, you know, accuracy, it's like it's just absolutely the most egregious violation right. of what the purposes of the rooms were. And yet it is now giving prominence, taking the, the most architecturally prominent room and giving it prominence of lifestyle yeah. that it, it, it should now enjoy. And so I think that I find that to be, those to be very interesting transformations. They, they happen in fits and starts, like sometimes incrementally and then sometimes it's just yeah. uh, a big. You know, a big thing that's happening in Boston, you know, Boston has so many beautiful old townhouses. And if you think about it, um, like in the South End, uh, which is, you know, where we did so much work, uh, you know, townhouses were great when you, you know, you graduated from school and you moved into a townhouse and maybe you were on the fourth floor and, you know, so what. Right. And then the minute that you had a baby, right. it was, a uh, forgetting about the Boston schools, right. it was, you know, you suddenly had a problem. How do you get that baby carriage up and down those four flights of oh, stairs right. and, you know, or whatever. Um, and uh, consequently, people who also, you know, let's say who are uh, my age, who are living in a building like that and want to stay there forever, but recognize that at some point getting up and down those stairs could be really a problem. Um, so, you know, the retrofitting and conversion of older structures with elevators and, and so forth is a really um, 
big part of some of the work that's happening in older cities like Boston today. And the interesting thing is you can look at that and you can look at it in a very kind of conventional way, like, okay, here's this building, we need to put an elevator in it so that you know it can do this and that. But if you look at the problem and say, okay, well, this is an opportunity. We have to put an elevator in this building. How does it allow us to rethink? That means that the parlor no longer has to be the parlor. Mm -hmm. Actually, the living space could be on the roof. And mm -hmm. um, the, you know, it allows you to rethink the whole program of the building because you are making this change uh, that might otherwise be very pragmatic. That, 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 all, and that alters the hierarchy of the building that is implicit in the effort right. <laughs> necessary to get, exactly. get up through it. Right. Exactly. Right. Right. That's, so. That's, that's great. Um, um, now, let me ask you another question, because this is really happening. And you know, I think, our new, our new board member, Kelly Sato of uh, Erdling. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's an unusual name for it's a, the developer it's out of the West Out of Coast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Portland, yeah. um, who did 318A, uh, A. A, uh, A Street. Um, Moving to not micro units, but moving a, a custom, but 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 tweaking the size and character and price point of units outside of the norm. How, what do you think about micro units? Do you think they are are? I assume everybody in the audience knows that they uh, that the city, this city, and many others have already built some and are considering a lot more micro unit apartments, very small apartments, so they can are able to keep you, recent college graduates, in town because they would, in principle, provide a, a lower price point. So, micro units. I think of micro units as smart studios. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that there's a lot of um, buzzwords around micro units, right. and um, you know, micro units have been around for a really long time. If you go to the um, uh, uh, architecture Museum in Paris, you'll see a apartment that the very famous architect and furniture designer Gerrit Rietveld designed, and it is a micro unit. Uh. And there's a bed, and there's a, a kitchen, and they're all kind of folded together, and the whole thing is, you know, the size of the space we're sitting in, and it's right. brilliant. Right. But, I mean, I don't think it's a completely new idea. Right. I think right. it's about how do you take small, and if you think about Japan, for sure. example, where Apartments have traditionally been very small, and the, and, uh, the culture is so uh, tuned to really thinking about details and how things fit together and so forth. You know, uh, this has been around for a long time. I think that the, I think the concept of creating really smart studios is a great idea, um, especially when they're paired with the kind of amenities in the building that you would not otherwise be able to. Uh, have or afford. I'm concerned, though, that the price per square foot that is being charged for these units is so high that it's sort of defeating yeah. the purpose. And um, you know, in a way, we have a very a lot of housing coming online in right. Boston in the next few years. And I actually hope there's a little bit too much mm -hmm. because I think it'll create some uh, development pressures to actually bring some of those prices down so that all of you folks can stay, which I hope you all do. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I guess I would, I would add only that it, it seems that the context for the discussion about mi micro units is what's changed, maybe. You're right, absolutely. There have been clever, innovative, very small spaces. I mean, it's kind of been kind of one of the things that, you know, in the Corbeck, in the Le Corbusier exhibition yeah. at, at the Museum of Modern Art, there's an example of one of his that I was un previously unaware of. Yeah, I was either, is this like, is this unit really small because it's really efficient, or were people smaller then? Yeah, well, b uh, or both, both. By the way, uh, <laughs> as, as with many things, both things can be true. I find this explained, this answers a lot of seemingly... Yeah, it's like, uh, the bed is really small. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. And yes, they were, they were all five, six. <laughs> right, exactly. Right? Um, well, I think it's I, I think it's interesting because micro units are a great kind of architectural segue into the civic scale because they are the conversation we're having now is not about only about architectural cleverness although what our friends are doing at MIT Media Lab in this area is it's so amazing. cool no, it, is it will amazing. blow your mind. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, we had a visit from um, uh, uh, our get our friend this morning's uh, oh, colleague. Yes. Um, uh, that's okay. We're having we'll have a yeah, brief here. senior moment, and then we'll we'll move on. Kent Larson, Kent Larson right. at, at MIT Media Lab was here earlier with both his 
he heads the group that does both the collapsible car that in version 2.0, you don't even have to go to the rack to get, it drives itself over, you get into it, you drive where you're going, get out, it drives itself back to charge itself. It's pretty cool. You know, actually, Kent Larson uh, had been talking to us about the possibility of having someone living on site in a micro unit at District Hall. Ultimately, we ended up with some plumbing and um, uh, legal problems to make something uh, like that happen, uh, but the idea was there. So, yeah, um, yeah, 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 you know, anyway. yeah. On-site custodian, sort of guinea pig, living in a... Well, I don't know if any of you have ever been uh, to the Standard Hotel in West Hollywood, but for quite a few years, uh, right above the front desk, they had a glass box. A terrarium. That, uh, sort of a terrarium that someone was living in. Oh, I didn't know. Oh, yes, they the were person living in. So you, I remember checking in, and she walked out. She was brushing her teeth. <laughs> you know, it was right, right above the front desk. I was like, hmm, this, is this is performance art in Perform kind, of, exactly. kind of Paris Hilton territory. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, which made it all the more awkward that when I went out there and stayed there with my then sixth grade son, and we arrived on a flight that had been delayed from Boston at like 2.30 in the morning. Yeah. And he was walking in, you know, really tired, dead tired. And we go and to check in, and there's basically a naked woman in a, in a terrarium above the check-in desk. Yes. I said, son, we're, we're, gonna, we're just going <laughs> to pay, yeah. no, pay, pay no attention that to that. That had a short shelf life, but it was interesting <laughs> for a while it lasted. Anyway, um, OK, let me, let me um, um, uh, shift gears. Um, I do want to talk a bit about the, the role that you have been able to carve out for yourself, because it's really, with very few exceptions, it's different from all of our other, you know, the architecture colleagues our age who have, who have decided to make Boston their professional home. I, many of us are not from here. You, Tim Love, myself, uh, uh, Alex and mine, I don't think is from here. Um, but you have found a way to be both uh, an architect, an urban designer, a sort of public I don't want to say activist, more Can't like <laughs> real, well, a pub, but a real pub, a participant and leader in a public process. And I just wonder, you know, I have an inkling as to how that got started, but, but why don't you talk to us about how, you know, you're working at a, a very good uh, local firm, CBT, as I recall, before you started your own business, um, you're doing good work, at, you know, on large scale. You decide to start your own enterprise. I assume you did it with a commission. Yes, for and, my sister. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And with that, but how did it segue from all your attention being paid to how do I survive in this world of architecture on my own to um, playing such a significant role so early in your career in the development of the South End? Well, I mean, you know, thank you for the question. I, I think that um, a lot of it is luck, you know, being in the right place at the right time. And I think that everyone, you know, when you you have to have the, you need to be observing the world around you and recognize opportunities when they present themselves and take them. When I came to Boston, I knew nobody here. Mm. I, I don't have family here. I right. didn't have any connections to this place. And actually, that was one of the things that was so appealing to me about mm. it, um, was that it was kind of a clean slate. And uh, I moved into a neighborhood by chance that was going through some pretty significant transformation, and I saw an opportunity and I took it. That's part of the story. Um, I would say the other part of the story is that, um, so I grew, up in a, uh, I grew up in a lot of places, but where I went to junior high school and high school was in Western Pennsylvania in a town called Johnstown, Pennsylvania, which was a small town, struggling small mill town. And uh, my stepfather was a lawyer in that town. And um, he was very engaged civically and um, uh, I could see the impact that he had on the community and the respect that he had in the community. Likewise, my father, who was an architect, by the way, in Geneva, Switzerland, which is also a small town, um, was also very engaged in a community of a certain scale where his projects were really making a difference. Mm -hmm. And you could see neighborhoods transforming. Um, and I could see it as I was growing up that, you know, this was this way and then this building was built and then the neighborhood changed. Uh, you know, a lot of my colleagues do work, and I respect it tremendously, do work all across the country, all over the world. Um, um, and they often do it in cities that they spend time understanding and building and may never go back to again. Right. Um, I was just not interested in that. Right. 
I was really interested in uh, the understanding the community that I lived in and uh, serving it in some way and, um, uh, and making a difference uh, here. I guess I'm a regionalist, if you will. And um, it isn't to say that we haven't done work. I mean, we've done work in Abu Dhabi and Paris, and we've done exciting work all over the world. But when all is said and done, I am um, uh, most engaged with the work that we do uh, here in Boston because I can see the impact it has on the community and uh, both, you know, hopefully good. Um, and um, you get the feedback pretty directly. So I actually bring it back to my sort of small town roots in mm -hmm. a way and say that, you know, Boston is, is a big enough city to be a big city, but it operates in many ways like a series of small towns, the South End being one, Fort Point being another. Um, and I'm really attracted to that. I'm really, uh, uh, I'm, it, it feels good. You know, even New York, which is a city that I worked in for a long time and which I had intended to move back to. I love New York. New York is an a incredibly stimulating and exciting uh, place to be. But, you know, even a skyscraper in New yeah, York yeah. gets swallowed up in a matter of weeks. It yeah. has no impact. People like it's up and then it's done and then, yeah. you know, it's on to the next yeah. thing. And it is the way the city just absorbs whatever comes into it is amazing. Yeah. But also a little off-putting to me. I, I like the idea that you know you can make a project and that it can make a difference. Yeah. Um, and you know what? I, excuse sure, me. sure. People sense that. Mm -hmm. So when you believe in your community and you care about what happens to that, um, people understand that, and and then uh, and then they seek you out because mm -hmm. they trust that your intentions are good. And that's different than like sometimes parachuting into a community. I can understand sometimes you come into a community that's very different than the one that you're from and the people are immediately like, what do you know about this right, place? Right, and, you know, right, right. what do you know about me? You know? Right, right. No, that's sorry, that's just your, your mic. Oh. <laughs> oh, geez, wow. Okay. <laughs> okay. I won't do that again. Um, I promise not to strike you, so. Boom. Oh, um, uh, for emphasis. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, that, that, that's yeah. what you, led me to what we Well, did. I think it, you know, it's, it's, it's meaningful because you know, a lot of these folks in the audience are, uh, I think, aspiring to be leaders in their chosen fields. I hope and, so. And, and, it, and it, is, it can seem daunting when you're you know, 21 um, about how, you know, how am I going to do that? Um, and I, and I, I appreciate the kind of um, sort of simple, incremental, nature of that, that, you know, you don't just sort of go in guns blazing and say, I'm here to lead everyone to the promised land, right? right. right? No, uh, that's not going to work very well. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But rather that you just, you, you, you pick a place where you feel like you can have an impact and you stick with it and, and, and you have, I mean, clearly you have. And, you know, then horizons will open up and, you know, other things become possible. But, but um, you know, there's this great quote um, I think it's Edmund Burke, mm. um, where uh, I was at, a, a, at some conference and someone was talking about it and, and uh, you know, there's uh, so much discussion about like finding yourself, you right, know, that right. like life is about finding yourself. Right. And his quote is, you know, life is not, a, I'm going to get it wrong, but paraphrasing, you know, life is not about finding yourself, it's about creating yourself. Right, right, right. And I think that that's really true. Right. Um, so, you know, as you, you know, for me, it, it, what, this was not a deliberate journey. It was, I, I, at each step of the way, I saw opportunities and I just built on them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, anyway. Yeah. Well, that's, no, that, 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 that's great. Um, now, let me ask you this. Um, you've had a chance to do, obviously, really quite a lot of different kinds of projects. Um, interiors, retail interiors, which are completely different. Totally. Um, um, d lots of different kinds of residential work, this kind of civic work. Well, tell me a business, uh, uh, sorry, a building type that you haven't done that you really want to do. In other words, you know, there's a lot of different, th th these students don't all probably look at it this way, but in architecture we often think about the world in terms of building types that there's, you know, uh, you know, 
schools, libraries, uh, office buildings, condo buildings, SROs, whatever, all kinds of different building types. And you, I know you haven't certainly, you know, you haven't done all of them by any means. Are there some that you, you know, there are some architects who really, you know, they always wanted to do a religious building, or they've always wanted to do uh, a school, an educational building, or are there things like that that you haven't had a chance to do yet that you really oh, yes. want so, to do? So many, so many. I mean, you know, there's some project types that are a little bit formulaic, mm -hmm. um, like hospitals, for example, right. um, that I think are very interesting. I mean, I think that the rules and the formulas are constantly changing, right. and I've, I know a lot of people who work in that world, and, and they're really smart, and they're really thoughtful about how um, to put the puzzle pieces together right. in a different way. But that's never been fundamentally what I was interested in. Um, uh, you know, you touched on a few of them. I mean, uh, you know, I think to do a spiritual space of some kind would be uh, uh, actually particularly for a, a group other than my own, which mm -hmm. would be very interesting, I right. think would be right. a fascinating. In a more uh, analytical way. Yes, yeah. and to sort of try and understand and capture uh, and evoke, uh, you know, what what uh, the community is uh, hoping for there. Um, uh, I think that you know, District Hall was our one of our very first civic projects, and um, I hope it leads to others because right. uh, seeing how people uh, interact with the building and seeing how it has an impact on the community um, is really been really exciting for me. It's only been about a month, and I'm already like I can't believe uh, you know I can't believe how excited I am about it. Um, so I hope that leads to other opportunities of its kind. And and you know um, uh, other projects that I really like. It's almost less about the project type than than projects that are catalytic in some ways. Um, uh, Darian Fortier there, who's a graduate of Northeastern, who's from my office, uh, and uh, I worked on a project in Troy, New York, not far from her hometown. Um, it unfortunately is not going to be realized, but it was a really exciting thing to work on because it was about um, transforming a city that is a little bit down at heel and giving it an opportunity to be reborn into mm -hmm. something else in the context of New England and post-industrial cities, which right. I do love so much and right, understand right. quite well. Um, I love those kinds of projects. Right, 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 right. And I hope we have more of them. Well, I know you well enough to know that I think you certainly always like to deal with projects that have some kind of um, explicit history to them. Yes. That, that, that they're not, you know, I, I can't see you as happy, I mean, you would do it, I know, but. I can't see you as happy being given a uh, hundred acres You're in so right. the middle of Arizona <laughs> to build um, your your dream, uh, you know, development uh, because you need you yes. need culture to react to. No, it's the lifeblood of what you do. You're absolutely right. I think it's you know I think that must be one of the reasons why I'm attracted to Boston because mm -hmm. Boston is one of those cities that if you just scratch the surface, there's so much interesting history. Uh, right below the surface. Um, obviously, there are cities all over the world like that, but uh, new cities are fascinating, but they're not quite as interesting to me as the uh, older city that has some sort of layering and some sort of history that you can react to. So it's a little bit like, you know, District Hall was an evolution of understanding, you know, Boston as an old harbor town, or the, the project place building, which was the SRO uh, project, was built on the site of Boston's former city gate. Um, and mm. I loved the idea that, you know, that this building, which was sort of a gateway to, uh, for people's lives, changing people's lives, was sitting on the site of what was the city's uh, port, uh, you know, portal of entry. Right. Um, right. You know, re allowing, I mean, things like that just excite me, they right. interest right. me. And uh, when you don't have a historic context, uh, it's a little bit more challenging, but you know, nature provides its own context. Well, well. It, it does. And, and actually, um, I want to encourage students to, uh, by the way, I wasn't just checking my email and checking, we have, we have a Twitter feed so students can ask questions oh. via Twitter. Okay. So I encourage folks to, yeah. um, to um, remember that it's at hashtag understanding design. Um, 
And I also want to uh, invite students to start thinking about the questions they may want to come up and ask. But before we do that, I want to sort of just quickly go through the, the glue of this course, which is these, these eight words. And we can be very quick about this, but because usually by the time we get to this point in the, in the conversation, there's a reason we have these eight words for everybody, because we've almost always covered things that have to do with many of them in the course of a natural conversation. But, um, but let's just go through them. I, I, I think I told you uh, at the outset, um, the first word we, we talk about is context. And I guess in a way we were just talking about the context, the, the, the context for you is, is got to be a cultural and, and architecturally rich one. Yes. Um, uh, and I agree with you. That is a, a, not that I'm going to take the role as your analyst, but um, I, you know, that is why Boston you know, Boston, unlike even a lot of other older cities, has so many different histories. Yes, right. That's true. It's really hard to ignore. It's not and just it, the buildings; it, the the street patterns are fundamentally different. And as we understand about history, it's about you know history has many dimensions, and it's about the history you choose. You know, right. too. It's it's so, it, and that has its own meaning. And, and so, you know, yes, I agree. Yeah. Okay. The next question, of course, is for an architect is, is sort of difficult, you can imagine, is, is question or, or problem. And that is, and you know, this is what I was trying to tease out when I asked you about the different kinds of residential buildings, is that it, seems to, it seemed to me that, in fact, oftentimes you really, there may be the same menu of problems or questions that you deal with as an architect, but the order of them is different. Yes. Which is the dominant one can often be different, I, yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. No, uh, the, ab absolutely. And again, that goes back to the client. Yeah. You know, the nature of the question has to do, I mean, you know, in the end, uh, this is a, uh, we are uh, providing uh, a service to a client about, uh, that, that involves design, and the problem is, actually the most difficult thing to do is to design for oneself. Um, right. But um, because, you know. You get so used to. Yeah, because you're used, you're used to reacting to, you know, to a question or to, to a problem. Um, but to me, the question, it, it, it's about listening. The question is always different. Mm -hmm. The question is always different. Right. And there are always a number of questions, but it's like which one rises to, the, to the top right. um, as the, the most difficult problem to be solved. And then things kind of fall around it. Um, I mean, and other questions come up during the process, too. And, and FP3, I mean, the whole structural um, code circulation thing was pretty close to the top of that Absolutely. conversation. Yeah. Um, so it was, I mean. And that question wasn't necessarily shared with the public. You know. There's the, the questions that you know you have internally, mm -hmm. um, and the questions that you have externally. And in many ways, in FP3, you know, people often say, "Oh my gosh, it was such a, you know, involved public process." And you know, how did you get through that process? In many ways, the most daunting part of that project was when I walked into the building with my project architect Scott Thompson, and we stood in this shaft, and you know, there was this cut out through this entire building and we were like, oh my God. I hope we're doing, I hope I hope we know what we're, we're doing. doing this right. <laughs> I know exactly. Um, that was, you know, that was really the most uh, daunting part. Well, but that's actually a very good point to make is a lot of people don't realize that for most architecture projects, and certainly in cities, there's really more than one client. There, yes. there, there, there might be one investor, one owner, but actually, in a city like Boston, that's by no means the end of the conversation. No, not, not even not close. Not even close, yes. I mean, the, 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 there are constituents, stakeholders, who have a huge voice. And if they are not satisfied, it doesn't happen. Yeah. So that's, so that's why you're not speaking out of two sides of your mouth. In fact, there are different groups to talk to yeah, who, I mean, who have, have different deliverables. That's the thing. That, that's why I love the profession so much is because, you know, on any given day, you kind of have to recalibrate. You're always, like, thinking about, you know, who the next group is that you have to meet with or talk to or address, yeah. you know, and I find that interesting. And this whole question of empathy that, that uh, about understanding the client is, of course, what makes what we do so fundamentally different from art, per se. I mean, so many people in general think, oh, art and design, it's kind of the same thing. No, I couldn't right. disagree more. Um, right. um, one is re responsive. Yeah. Um, I mean, in principle, if an artist has trouble I'm doing his or her own work. That's a much more serious problem. When yes. you said, when you said, sometimes the architect has, has has trouble with themselves as the client, but that's because their life's blood is responding yeah. to the challenges of another. I actually have said to architects uh, who say they don't want to design for themselves um, that 
I think that's a cop out. Uh, uh. Because I think that um, it forces you to ask yourself questions that uh, are are difficult. Right. What's important to you? Right, you right, know? right, I mean, right. You're so used to responding. Uh, I remember reading somewhere that Rem Koolhaas said that he never wanted to design something for himself because he thought uh, it was too easy or it was a cop out. Right. Like, really? <laughs> that sounds like a cop out to me. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Like, I'd like um, to see the house he would design for himself. Um, you know, I, I, this, this, I, I, think we, I, I had a question about innovation, but I think we can skip it because I think it's, it's not actually that good a question. So, <laughs> so I, I do think it is worth talking about briefly the, the, the revolutionary period that you and I have lived through with regard to representation, yes. visualization. You were saying a minute ago, you know, I now know pretty well what a project is going to look like. And of course, when we started in this business, I mean, I, it's not to say we had no idea, but oftentimes close to no idea. That's right. Uh, and, 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 and how, but, but of course, it'd be easy to say, well, that's nothing, that's an unmitigated good, but in fact, the ability to pr produce photorealistic images early in a process has pitfalls and downsides too, no? Do you, do you limit how much photorealism you include in very early presentations? You know, that's a really interesting question. I, I would say that, um, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, the most technologically uh, advanced uh, member of our team, um, and I very much respect um, that a lot of the people who come to work with me uh, come with their own sets of tools and their own sets of, of programs that they like or, you know, like. And I try and respect that because I'm actually not interested in having you know, this is the only program we right, use right, in the office right. to do this or that. Because I think that's, um, I do think that, especially in the world of computer programming, they become deterministic. They mm -hmm. become, sure. uh, uh, they force you into certain choices. Uh, we should probably do a little bit more of mixing it up than we do, and I think that's a, it's an interesting question, like, you know, suddenly build a model, you know, right, instead right. of looking at it in that way. Right. Um, it's hard with the pressures of time and right, so forth right, that, right, we, right. that we work under. Um, because, of course, with all of these new uh, technologies, um, everybody expects everything faster. For sure. And um, so it's not like it bought us a lot more time in the design right, process. Right, right. If anything, it's collapsed it. Um, but really, the question, let me sharpen the question a little bit, because yeah. it's really about the, uh, the fact that you can now, you can, you have the yeah. capacity to show a very photorealistic image of a project very early in its development that, and you know where I'm headed with this, that a client might either fall in love with or be repulsed by when you're still just working things out. Yeah. Um, does that, is that a... I guess I put it back to, back to you in a different way. Because you can represent things so accurately so early, um, you know, there used to be a certain element of architecture being a surprise, not just to the architect, but to the client. Sure, sure, sure. And they were sort of on a journey with you. Right. Now they have a level of expectation of understanding what they're exactly getting what's gonna happen. Uh, uh, ahead of time. And you know what? Uh, although I miss the old days right, a little right. bit, um, that is legitimate. Yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah. okay. These what, things cost a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. I, I think what I will say though, and uh, I've had this conversation with people in my office, because even people right out of school can create really beautiful objects in three dimensions. Um, that are, you know, uh, on the screen. Uh, it makes me appreciate really good built work mm. even more. Oh, I, I, because you, you know, you can look at something. It can look really sexy. It can look like, wow, that's amazing. And then you go up and see it in person, and it's really badly detailed. Oh, and you know the thing's going to fall apart in three or four years, and it doesn't work the way it's promised. And yes, it's a really cool image, but it doesn't work well at yeah. all. Um, I think that the thing that I lament a little bit about the new technology is that we have become so seduced by imagery that we are spending less time talking about how buildings work right. and right. Um, programming them correctly, and it's just like you know well, how whiz bang, you know. Yeah, yeah. Cool no, that's a, that's, a, that's a really good. Point. And that's the that's the downside to me. Uh, less than the actual photorealistic technology, right. it's more the issue of how it's changed the focus of how, what we value in right, a building. Right, right. So.
Well, as you know, I'm going to Germany later today, yes. and of course, that means that the quality of the built environment is going to go up by about 150 percent. Yes, that's um, true. Within 24 hours, <laughs> right? Um, the the construction quality, it's like from another planet. It's, right. It's totally different. Um, of course, they have a completely different uh, delivery method and regulatory framework. Yeah. Yep, I, it's totally true. Um, okay, th let me ask you one more question. If we have, if if students have any questions for our guest, please. Uh, make your way up to the microphones. Um, but it's a question, it's about metrics. And of course, obviously, you have business measures for success in your business, i.e., are we losing our shirt? Right. Am, I buying, am I buying a second home? Right. Well, how is it going? Um, but I know that you have other measures that you use to evaluate how you think your work is going. In other words, do you meet with some of your associates and kind of talk about things on an, uh, review the works the work of the year uh, every now and again or i mean how do you we do i mean we absolutely do i mean um you know obviously we want to do good work we want to do new and interesting work and uh, we want to stay in business um, you know architecture and design is not generally you're not you're not going to find folks who are generally motivated by uh, financial success alone because it's just not the right path. Mm -hmm. um, I will say that in, in my office, um, the, um, it's very important to me uh, that my uh, staff is excited and engaged about the work that they're doing and that, um, uh, uh, and that we're all on this kind of journey together and I think that, you know, the fact that I can maybe help make that a more exciting and fulfilling journey, both from an architectural design point of view, but from a civic design point of view, from an office culture point mm -hmm. of view, yeah. that's really the most, I love going to work every morning. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I can't imagine, well, I can't imagine because I've had it in my past, that idea where you sort of walk into your office and you're just like, oh. You know, you open the door and it's like, you know, I, I, you know, what, what am I going to deal with today? I, um, I, I love walking in the door, and I hope that everyone who works in my office feels the same way, um, and um, that's really important to me. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. So, so thank you for coming, David. Uh, I totally want to echo your comment uh, to everyone in the room and in Boston to go to District Hall. Uh, for a meeting, for a lunch, for a drink. It's a great place. Thank um, you. What I'm interested in knowing, um, in contrast like FP3, uh, where it's going to be there hopefully for 100 plus years, District Hall was built on a tiny budget of $5 million and sort of in an experiment, right? Let's see where it is in 10 years. I believe when you built it, you built it with the foundation strong enough to actually build vertically, correct? Well, um, you know, yes and no. I, I, it's a temporary building, but there is really no such thing as a temporary building yeah. in the Boston Building Code. So it's built to be there, you know, forever. Yeah. Um, the foundation, what's interesting is the building, the reason why I think it may have a longer lifespan than 10 years is that the building is built on the park site, on the civic site. So it's not like in 10 years the building could come down and they could build an office building right. on that site. It, doesn't it's, have that it's, it will always have to have a right. civic purpose. So yes, you could take the building down and build, uh, you know, they could put a, uh, some other kind, a library on the site or something like that. Um, but it's, it will never be uh, an office building. And, and I think that that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Have, have you put thought though into, I mean, it's officially two weeks old, I think, a yeah. week old. Um, but you, have you put thought into what the future of the building will be as everything goes up around it? Uh, what it'll look like in 10 years? Yeah, well, you know, that's a really good question. I mean, I think the, the, when I was presenting our work in the Innovation District, I was talking about how one thing led to another, right? And one of the very exciting things about District Hall, which I didn't really talk about today, was that it actually led us to become part of the design team uh, that is going to design the park and the uh, 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 park pavilions that are going to be built uh, in the rest of that park with Reed Hildebrand, a very, very wonderful landscape architecture firm here in Boston. Um, and, um, you know, 
that park, that civic space, not just the building, not just the district hall, but the park and the, uh, and the park pavilions that will be in it, will be the heart of this neighborhood. Will be, it'll be the part of the neighborhood where people walk out of these 15, 20 story buildings and it's where they will engage the public realm, where they will engage the civic realm. And um, you know, so many people have said to me that one of the things that they love about District Hall is that there's nothing above it. You know, they're not in the lobby of a building. They're not on the 15th floor of a building. They're not in a hotel. Right, right. They are in a building that is part of the public realm. And it's just a psychological thing. Mm -hmm. It's not even a, a, you know, a physical thing. And so um, I hope that what happens with the building is that the building helps activate this really amazing civic space, which will be uh, opening in about two years. Um, and then uh, it will either turn into something else or it will go away, but as long as it's kind of performed its, its role in um, making that, you know, you think about like World's Fair pavilions uh, mm. that have come and gone. Um, but at the time, they, uh, they had an impact and they did something for that place. Um, uh, you know, I mean, the, the Eiffel Tower is obviously the most uh, prominent example. That one stayed, but, uh, and I'm not comparing the two, but I think that the, the idea that these temporary buildings can actually do really exciting things for cities and that they don't necessarily have to be there forever because, you know, we were talking about this earlier today. Um, I don't, I've lived long enough to know that buildings don't last forever and, um, and sometimes they need to move on to a higher best use or they need to be adapted to something else. So you kind of have to let go of that notion that it'll always be there um, and think about what it's doing right now. Um, because even FP3, I mean, you know, who knows what the future sure. of residential life is going to be like. Um, you know, when they built those uh, buildings for the wool warehouses at FP3 in 1896, they never imagined that you know uh, they would be upscale condos for uh, tech workers uh, right. with you know uh, Michelin star rated restaurants on right. the ground floor. That's not what they were thinking, and you know what? That's okay. Run by, by I should add, run by our f earlier guest. This oh, Barbara. Barbara Lynch. Oh, yeah. she's so wonderful. <laughs> okay. Well, David, thank you so much for oh, joining thank us. You.